Hello everybody, welcome to our lecture for the other part of endocrine system. So far we have been able to, you know, um, go through part one and part two of the endocrine system. The first part we did the introduction, what is a hormone, how does it go about, how the hormone gets into blood and how does it arrive the target organ. We explain the difference between the two types of hormones. Uh, if you have not yet watched the lecture, then you go back to the part one and part two so that you can be able to get a, a good flow from here. And in the second part, we try to talk about the mechanism of hormones. Now, please, I just want to correct an error that I, I discovered in the part two of the video uh, during the, in the mechanism. The enzyme I mentioned as um, adenyl cyclase, which helps to convert ATP to AMP, uh, to cyclic AMP, that's cyclic adenosine monophosphate, is actually adenylate cyclase, okay? Adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase, this way, not adenyl. Adenylate cyclase, it converts um, ATP to cyclic AMP, all right? Hope the correction has been taken into consideration. Um, if it has been, then we can now continue to the next uh, thing that we have to do on the endocrine system. Now, I will just try to, you know, go through all the glands of the endocrine system because most of the times the exam, you are being asked what is the hormone, they are being asked to give the mechanism of hormones, and then you can be able to ask, you, they could ask you maybe, you know, to give the functions of some hormones in the body, and um, you have to know all of that. So, I will start with the different endocrine glands in the body. We have different endocrine glands, and I did mention in the first video that the endocrine gland, uh, sorry, the endocrine system and the nervous system are the two main systems of the body that are involved in homeostasis. So if they are absent, a lot of things are going to go wrong in the body. So what happens is that um, if we're talking about the endocrine system, endocrine system, and we are discussing the glands today, endocrine system. Now, they are the main glands or the main endocrine glands in the body are you have the pituitary gland, usually a diagram you draw of a person. Okay, just permit me draw this um, diagram like this. Okay, if this is a person, these are the hands, this is, these are the feet, or these are the legs, something like this. You usually have a very um, a schematic diagram. Okay. Okay, you have in the brain, of course, you have uh, in the brain here, you're going to have the um, pituitary gland. Okay, you have the pituitary gland. Uh, pituitary. The pituitary gland it sits uh, in a depression in the brain on what we call the skinhead bone as the cella toshica. Uh, you don't need to know all of that if you are advanced level. Now, you have the pituitary gland, okay, which is the master gland of the body. It is a master bird, the, its boss is a uh, hypothalamus because the hypothalamus actually tells it what to do. We are going to go into that uh, in just uh, in some few seconds. So here we have the pituitary gland, okay, then still in the brain again, in between the two cerebral hemispheres, in between the two cerebral hemispheres, we have the pineal gland. Now the pineal gland is there, is also an endocrine gland, it secretes what we call melatonin, the hormone melatonin, and melatonin helps in um, Melatonin helps in control of the circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm, for example, you are, you know, towards the night, you're supposed to, you're sleeping towards the night. And during the day, you're very, very awake. This is because uh, during, when, um, uh, uh, during increased darkness, there is increased secretion of melatonin. So it, darkness actually stimulates the uh, more production of melatonin, okay? And since there is increased um, concentration of melatonin in your blood, it is going to induce sleep. He has his mechanisms. So that is the function of the pineal gland and is located in between the two cerebral hemispheres. Now the pituitary gland has a lot of functions, we are going to see that. And of course in the neck, if you are talking about the neck here, we have, um, we have uh, around, just around the trachea, we are going to have the thyroid gland. Okay, we have the thyroid gland which has two lobes, the right and the left lobe, joined by an isthmus. Okay, isthmus, isthmus, that way. Okay, so we call this one the thyroid gland. 
call it a thyroid gland. Okay, it helps to secrete the hormone thyroxine. Then just behind the thyroid gland, and can also calcitonin. So just behind the thyroid gland, we have four or six very small glands that are, atta are attached to but not joined to it. Okay, um, uh, that we call the parathyroid gland. Parathyroid, okay, just, you know, para, besides, uh, uh, besides the thyroid gland. Um, there are four to six of them. In some, indiv in some individuals have four, some have six. So we call it the parathyroid gland. They are just there behind it. And we, uh, they secrete the hormone parathyroid hormone. Okay, they secrete the parathyroid hormone. Now the parathyroid hormone and calcitonin are involved in calcium metabolism, which we are going to see. Then we also have um, uh, after that we are going to see the pancreas. Okay, remember that the, we mentioned the pancreas in the very first video, and we said the pancreas is kind of a mixed gland. It's both endocrine and exocrine. Now the endocrine part of the pancreas is the islets of Langerhans, okay, the islets of Langerhans, islets of Langerhans, okay, so it has, islets of Langerhans has um, um, uh, two types of cells, big types of cells that are called the alpha cells and the beta cells. The alpha cells secrete um, glucagon and the beta cells secrete insulin. Glucagon and insulin are involved in um, sugar um, a regulation regulation of blood sugar level in blood okay they maintain the regulation of blood sugar level in blood so uh, that is the function of the endocrine part of the pancreas because endocrine glands secrete into blood while exocrine secrete via ducts okay so here um, the pancreas is one percent endocrine and 99 percent exocrine that's secretion of pancreatic juice so if you are being asked to describe the endocrine function of the pancreas what they are asking in essence is to describe the is to, uh, is to describe uh, the, the regulation of blood sugar level and if you are asked to describe the exocrine function it is you are actually being asked to describe the digestive function of the pancreas okay and just uh, after that remember posteriorly on your posterior abdomen you have the kidneys okay located somewhere like that they are being they have a bean shape okay just behind your uh, the, the posterior, so you have a what we call on the posterior abdomen. So you have just on top of the kidneys, you have what we call the adrenal glands. Okay, you have the adrenals, the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands also play a very important role in the body. They are divided into a cortex and a medulla. We are going to see its structure and all of what it secretes as the lecture proceeds. Okay, and then from apart from that, another uh, set of glands that we have are either we either have the ovaries in the female. Either have the ovaries in the female, or you could have um, either have the ovaries in the female, or you could have the testes in males. Okay, you could have the testes in males. So you have the scrotum. Um, just an aside, the scrotum is actually located out of the body, all right? It's located out of the general uh, abdomen because in order to regulate the temperature of the testes. So that is why when places are very cold, the muscles there. Okay, the datus muscles, they are going to contract to pull the testes or to pull the scrotum towards your, uh, the body so that it should absorb heat from the body to maintain its temperature. And when places are hot, it descends, okay, in order to, you know, have a temperature a little bit less than that of the body temperature. So that is um, uh, the function of the scrotum and why is it located out of the abdomen is for regulation of temperature for the testes and also for the stems because high temperatures can actually kill the stems. Okay, so you have the testes, and the testes there, of course, are going to be the gonads in the male. So either uh, another set of uh, glands here, uh, uh, endocrine glands, are going to be either the ovaries in the female, okay, ovaries in the female, or we are going to be talking about the testes in males. Okay, so please, if you are being asked to give the main endocrine glands in the body, okay, I've already mentioned the pituitary. Uh, Let's put it like I've given the pituitary, then I've given something like I've, I mentioned something like the pineal gland, and I said it secretes what we call melatonin. Melatonin. Okay, and melatonin helps in control of the circadian rhythm. And finally, we have the ovaries, and then we have the testes. So we're going to go through all of these glands and see their functions. And, and I probably that is going to be the very, very complete lecture on the endocrine system. So please, if you have not yet um, um, uh, watched the first two parts, you go to get, you go back, get the introduction and get the mechanism of action of hormones. Okay. Now that is it for 
the different endocrine glands which are found in the body. Okay? So you take note of it, we have the pinea, the pituitary, the thyroid gland, the adrenal gland, the ovaries, the adrenals, there are two of them, the ovaries and the testes, then the pancreas. Okay? Okay, now let's start with the pituitary gland. What happens? What does the pituitary gland secrete? So we are going to be looking together. We are going to be consuming the pituitary gland together with the pineal gland. Uh, sorry, together with the hypothalamus. Now the pineal gland. I already explained what it does. So that's all about it. Uh, it's not really a major something. So here you have. If I have my hypothalamus here, okay, this is my hypothalamus. So it is going to be going to have something like this. Okay, so now let's consider this to be posterior. Okay, let's consider this to be posterior and uh, this to be anterior. So we have the hypothalamus, and uh, the hypothalamus here, yeah, sorry, the pituitary gland is divided into two, it's like just connected together with the hypothalamus. So it has, it's actually divided into two, it has a posterior lobe and an anterior lobe, okay? The posterior lobe of the pituitary gland does not secrete hormones, it simply stores hormones which are being produced by the hypothalamus, while the anterior pituitary gland actually produces hormones, okay? Please take note, the posterior pituitary gland, so we have the hypothalamus secretes, uh, produces two types of hormones here, we have a secret antidiuretic hormone, okay, anti um, diuretic, let me put it like this, anti-diuretic uh, diuretic hormone, okay, and uh, we have oxytocin, oxytocin, okay, what is the function of anti-diuretic hormone? It helps in the reabsorption of water from the kidneys, so we are going to give a lecture on osmoregulation, and during osmoregulation, you are going to see the function of ADH. It helps the reabsorption of water at the proximal, uh, sorry, at the distal convoluted tubules and collecting ducts of the kidneys, okay, in a, uh, during um, uh, very high osmotic pressures when there is high concentration of sugar or, sorry, of salt in, 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 in the living organism, in the um, tissue fluid. So it tries to, you know, absorb, it helps, in, it's being released by the pituitary gland to absorb, uh, help in, uh, to regulate the absorption of water. From the kidneys, which will now dilute those salts and reduce back the osmotic pressure back to normal. Okay, um, that's the function of antidiuretic hormone. And then for oxytocin, oxytocin helps in contraction of the uterus. All right, during birth, in order to expel the baby. So that's what is responsible for uterine contraction. And also sometimes, you know, during menstrual the, uh, the menstrual uh, menstruation in females, they also feel some pain. Okay, due to the secretion of oxytocin, which causes contraction of the uterus. And uh, also, we also have the oxytocin uh, functions in ejection of milk from the breast. So the breast has some smooth muscles, which, um, which have the setters of oxytocin. So when oxytocin binds to it, okay, it can be able to eject milk for the baby, you know, to suck, um, to suck it. Alright, so that is, a, uh, that is what the hypothalamus, those are the hormones that the hypothalamus produces and they are being stored in the posterior pituitary gland okay and then when there is time, it's time for them to be released, the posterior pituitary will release them into blood so it is not the one that produces them so this antidiuretic hormone is being um, produced by cells that we call the supraoptic nuclei some nuclei here, so specialized nuclei that we call supraoptic nuclei okay supraoptic supraoptic Okay, and uh, the oxytocin is being secreted by the one called the paraventricular. Paraventricular. Okay, secreted by what we call the paraventricular nuclei. Okay, supraoptic nuclei. Now, the supraoptic nuclei could also produce um, oxytocin, while the paraventricular could also produce ADH. But they are going to do so in small amounts. The main one that the supraoptic secretes is ADH, and the main one that the paraventricular secretes is oxytocin. So it means if you want to secrete the other, you have to secrete it in a very small quantity. And then these hormones are being carried by special kinds of nuclei from here. Okay, several kinds of neurons, right? They are actually neurons, nerve cells. Nerve cells are actually carry um, 
or neurons that carry the, the hormones from here to the posterior pituitary where they are being stored and released. Okay? Then, for the anterior pituitary, of course, it is it secretes six hormones. The anterior pituitary gland secretes six hormones, which we uh, summarize as flat peak. Okay? Flat peak, it is a mnemonic. Flat peak is a mnemonic, which we use in order to, you know, um, describe the six hormones which are being secreted by anterior pituitary. It secretes for it secretes number one, this L stands for follicle stimulating hormone, L stands for luteinizing hormone, A stands for adrenal corticotropic hormone, ACTH, adrenal, adrenal please, corticotropic hormone, and T stands for thyroid stimulating hormone, and P stands for prolactin, and G stands for growth hormone. Okay, T stands for thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, P stands for prolactin. Okay, and the G stands for growth hormone. Okay, now what causes the release? What which hormone from here, from the anterior, from the uh, from the hypothalamus? Please, this is the hypothalamus. You could also call the pituitary gland the hypophysis because it is found below the hypothalamus. Okay, so the antidiuretic hormone here. Um, uh, sorry. We are at the level of the flat peak. I have already mentioned the six hormones secreted by anterior pituitary. And what causes, we want to see what causes are released from the hypothalamus. So, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are together called gonadotropins. Okay? Gonadotropins. Gonadotropins because uh, gonadotrophs. We can also call them gonadotrophs. Let me put that is. Gonadotrophs or gonadotropins. Okay? It's, it's still fine. Now they are called gonadotrophs because they act on the gonads, either on the testes or on the ovaries. What causes the release from the hypothalamus are the gonadotropin releasing hormone. Okay, so we have the G, uh, we have the GNH, gonadotropin G releasing hormone G small n uh, RH, gonadotropin releasing hormone when it's being secreted by the hypothalamus cause the release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Remember, they are both called gonadotrophs because they act on the gonads. Then the adrenal corticotropic hormone, okay, actually acts on it acts on the adrenal glands, okay, acts on the adrenal glands, uh, specifically on the adrenal cortex, and so it releases being called what we call corticotropin releasing hormone, corticotropic releasing hormone, okay, C R H, corticotropic releasing hormone. CRH, corticotropic releasing hormone. Now, um, the T, thyroid stimulating hormone, which acts on the thyroid gland to stimulate the production of, um, of thyroxine, is actually being stimulated, is released, is being stimulated by what we call the thyrotropin releasing hormone. Okay, thyrotropin releasing hormone, please. Thyrotropin, thyrotropin releasing hormone. Uh, I think you have gotten this part. Uh, let me just have some space to write. So you have thyrotropin releasing hormone. Okay, thyrotropin releasing hormone. This one is corticotropic. Okay, corticotropic, corticotropic releasing hormone. Okay, so you have that. With corticotropic releasing hormone, of course, causes the release of. Um, adrenal corticotropic hormone and uh, thyrotropin releasing hormone causes the release of thyroid stimulating hormone. Then prolactin, the other please, prolactin is a bit different because it doesn't have any releasing of uh, prolactin releasing hormone. No, it has but a prolactin inhibiting factor. All right, it has a prolactin in inhibiting factor, prolactin inhibiting factor, PIF. Okay, which um, we, uh, we uh, try to uh, try to inhibit the secretion of prolactin. Remember that prolactin helps in the release of breast milk. Okay, it helps so it helps in the production of breast milk. Now, when a male, for example, is producing breast milk, maybe it could be due to a tumor or maybe let's say a cancer of the cells that are produce uh, that produce prolactin. So when they proliferate, they start producing prolactin, and the male can have what we call um, galactorrhea because it's producing breast milk is leaking out. So when breast milk is leaking out, leaking out from any body, we call it galactorrhea. So prolactin does not have um, a, a releasing factor, it has rather um, an inhibiting factor. Why growth hormone, okay, has what we call growth hormone releasing hormone, okay? Growth hormone releasing hormone, which causes its release. Or you can see how growth hormone inhibiting hormone 
all right, which causes the inhibition of growth hormone being released. Because all of these hormones, of course, they need to be regulated. If they are not being, their mechanisms don't have to regulate their secretion. If you don't regulate their secretion, they can cause one problem or the other. Okay. For example, the very prominent part which I'm going to use here is the growth hormone. Now, the growth hormone, when it is being secreted in in in, in less amounts, meaning that in very small quantities. The child, uh, or maybe the individual we are going to have what we call dwarfism. Okay, there's going to be dwarfism. Dwarfism, meaning that there's, there's no way to be growth. So maybe the individual might have a very small statue on the development and all of that. So you're going to have dwarfism because there's no growth hormone. Now, when the growth hormone is being secreted in excess, now in children it causes what we call um, gigantism. It causes gigantism. Uh, gigantism. Okay, it causes gigantism and in adults okay since if an adult has already grown and has stopped growing and then it happens that there's excess of growth hormone which is being produced it is rather going to lead to the growth of the extremities meaning that the palms become big the fingers become very large and all of that and that one we call uh, we call it acromegaly okay we call it acromegaly acromegaly so take note, in children it leads to gigantism, but in adults that have really grown and stopped, it leads to acromegaly, which is the um, extension of or the growth, ex extra growth of the extremities, maybe the ears, okay, the hands, the feet, they become so large, okay. And well, so please, I has no uh, has no no meaning there because uh, we just try to give meaning to the. Um, we just try to give meaning to the word, okay, so that it will sound, it will sound good. So that is it for, that is all for the anterior pituitary gland hormones. We have already seen the posterior pituitary gland hormones, where they are being secreted and when, and what is their function. We have also seen these ones, and where do they act? I already said, I don't know, but the hormone acts on the uh, adrenal cortex, CSH acts on the thyroid gland, these acts on slow muscles in the breast to cause new ejection, and growth hormone, of course, helps in growth. So that is it for the anterior pituitary gland, uh, or that is it for the pituitary gland as a whole. Now we are going to move to the next gland. Uh, if we are moving down in order, we are going to go to we are going to move straight to the thyroid gland. Okay, we move straight to the thyroid gland. Now the thyroid gland has two types of cells. It has what we call follicular cells and uh, parafollicular cells. That's what you should understand. Okay? Thyroid gland has two types of cells. It has um, thyroid gland has two types of cells. It has what we call follicular cells and uh, parafollicular cells. Now these follicular cells are the ones that secrete tyrosine. Tyrosine. And please note that tyrosine is actually lipid soluble. Alright, it's lipid soluble. So it secretes tyrosine. And, and tyrosine is in two forms. We have C3, triiodotyronine, and uh, C4, which is uh, tetraiodotyronine. Okay, okay. Then you have the parafollicular cells, or you can call them the C cells. Alright, we secrete calcitonin. Alright, we secrete calcitonin. Now, the T3 and the T4 can be able to release, they release into blood, they are released into blood, and they actually help in um, basal metabolism, they help in the regulation of the metabolism within cells. Now, and, uh, a, high, a type of hypothyroidism, for example, like goitam, you have uh, maybe on the secretion of iodine, or maybe less iodine in, um, in diet, and that less iodine will lead to less production of the thyroid um, hormone, which will lead to hypothyroidism. Alright, which is going to lead to hypothyroidism. And we are going to have um, the parafollicular cells there, which are going to secrete uh, calcitonin, and calcitonin helps in hypo, uh, is hypocalcemic. So it helps to regulate, it mediates the decrease, uh, the, um, the decrease of calcium 2 plus ions in blood. So it means that it helps in the absorption of calcium 2 plus from blood to bone. So it releases the level of calcium 2 plus in blood when it is being secreted. And it is very, very important in regulation in calcium metabolism. 
Now, if it reduces the level of calcium 2 plus, it means that it also, in, in fact, uh, remember calcium 2 plus is stored in bone and hydroxy appetite. So you have um, calcium 2 plus ions and you have um, the phosphate. So if you are reducing the level of calcium 2 plus in blood, it means that you are automatically reducing the level of phosphate ions in blood. Okay? And uh, we are going to now let's here. Let me just talk to you about the parathyroid gland. The parathyroid gland, on the other hand, is going to secrete parathyroid hormone, and that parathyroid hormone is going to help, okay, in uh, in rather increasing the level of calcium two plus ions in blood, okay. So that's the opposite of the uh, para uh, uh, para cells. So if you have been asked in the exam. What, uh, what are the hormones which are involved in calcium metabolism? It is going to be calciconin and parathyroid hormone from the parathyroid gland. And of course, the uh, calciconin helps to reduce the level of calcium and phosphate, and uh, parathyroid hormone helps in order to increase the level of calcium 2 plus and the phosphate ions in blood. So uh, I think that I'm going to end here for now. Thank you very much for watching the lecture. Watch out for the next um, episode in order for you to get the um, rest of the explanation on the other in the time glance. Thank you very much.